Hello and welcome, SS County College family. This is the Virtual Cafe, powered by Student Life and Activities. Today's episode number 59 is Black History, Past, Present, and Future. I'm going to tell you a quick little story about my experience at Essex. I came to Essex in 2009. I didn't have too many friends, even though a coworker had got me the job. I didn't have too many coworker uh, friends in the institution. So one of the first experiences I had here at Essex was with Dr. Robert Spellman. I was a young, heavy guy, and... I met Dr. Spellman in the hallway and he had told me he liked my work and what I was doing for the students and that he would like to work together. And that was 2009. And every single year since then, we have partnered together to do a Black History Month celebration, not even a presentation, a celebration of Black history, Black achievement, Black events, Black people. So we want to thank Dr. Spellman for joining us again for God knows how many Black History presentations, celebrations he's done with student life and activities at Essex over the years. But he's a great friend of our department, student life and activities, and I have much love for this man. And we're grateful to have him with us once more for the 2021 Black History celebration from student life. So we thank you all for tuning in with us today. And without any further ado, we want to get right to our very, very special guest, Dr. Robert Spellman. Dr. Spellman, how are you doing this morning? Terrific. Uh, and Joe, it's a pleasure to work with you and also Dean Slade and Dean uh, uh, Graham and everyone in your department. Uh, I've always felt there should be a cleavage between the student activity department and the academic areas because there isn't a separation. It's learning experiences. And I want to thank uh, Student Activities Department, particularly Dean Slade, many times in many years, every every semester, uh, had a bus from West Essex and a bus from Newark uh, to go to the Metropolitan Museum. And then we would go to Cathedral St. John Divine to study uh, Gothic architecture. And, and, and the Student Affairs Department helped the academic department give a sense of realism to our students. So I wanna thank you and Joe, I wanna thank you for your ingenuity and these programs, but we have so much to cover. I told uh, Joe to cut me off <laughs> when, when I don't wanna go too long, cause I'm a preacher too, you know, <laughs> preachers to go. But I have so much, there's so much to say about people of color. And what's sad about it, we're all the same uh, with this color under this skin color, people have made a big deal out of it. But the reason why we have to be so emphatic about it is that we've been left out of many things. Time Magazine did a series on the greatest civilizations that has ever existed, and they left out Egypt. How could you leave out Egypt? The longest lasted for 3,000 years. So we're still fighting these battles, and uh, previous um, black history up at West Essex, I talked about slavery, Oprah Winfrey and others made it because during slavery time, we weren't allowed to put a dictionary out there. We were not to learn. And so here you are students at Essex County College. No one can take your skin and deny you from your knowledge that you can get. Knowledge doubles every seven years, but we have more knowledge at our disposal than at any time in the history of the world. And as long as you have a computer, computer's not gonna ask you what your race is. The computer and technology is for you. And I want every student to listen uh, to what I'm saying. I said it a uh, minute, old preacher taught me that when an elephant is born in India, they take this great big chain and they put it on his ankles. Then when he grows up years later and he has so much power, uh, they take a little rope and they put it around his ankles. And in his mind, he thinks 
he's still chained to that building on that post, when in fact, he has the power to tear the whole thing down. And what I'm saying is, I'm going to show you a little bit of Harriet Tubman. There's a crucial scene there where she goes across. She wants the people to follow her, but there's a hesitancy. And Essex County College represents an opportunity to be free. There are different types of slavery. There is physical slavery, but there is also mental slavery, spiritual slavery. And when you think you can't win or you can't learn or you can't do or you can't achieve, you're falling into that category and you need people like us at Essex to coach you and pull you out. She went back 11 times and we come back every time that we might motivate you uh, to be a better student. I'm just so excited about learning. I'm so excited about Essex and the history of Essex. We don't want to go into it too much in depth, but it was a Mrs. Mary Birch who was on a commission that was appointed by the governor after the riots in 1966. And uh, they had to determine where each community college would lo be located because we didn't have community colleges then. So the one came up for Essex, they wanted to put it in Verona. And of course, students, if we had gone to Verona with the bus service the way it is, that would not have been what it is now, which is an opportunity center for everyone in our community. So we come to you with a sense of satisfaction that over 52 years now, we've been turning out students, not just doctors and lawyers, but people who are concerned about people, people who care about people. And so Essex County College is fully accredited, exceeding expectation. That's what I was telling you about that elephant didn't know the power we had. Well, you need to find out that you have a lot of power. And over history, students, we've had people of color who have just been outstanding. On the right is the Queen of Sheba, and I wish I had time to show you that, might show you a little excerpt. When she met Solomon and she went to uh, Israel from Ethiopia, and uh, she learned and then she took back uh, the culture and learning that she had with Solomon. On the left, King Tutankhamun, he didn't uh, do anything absolutely famous, famous but his, his treasure was the one that Howard Carter found in 1923 and unearthed it. And that gold, solid gold mask, I've been to Cairo nine times and I've stood right in front of it. What a powerful piece of history. And then I don't know if you've ever heard of the Buffalo soldiers who uh, see slaves went in different directions when they were freed or they would break away. One of the places they went, they went to the Indian reservations. And many of us have relatives at Cherokee and what have you. The Indian re reservations was a place of escape and the slaves were intermarried with the Cherokee and the other tribes. Another place they went, was to a Dutch country, we call it today, but the, the uh, people, the Quakers, took in slaves. One of those slaves, her grandmother was a slave, but her granddaughter became the first graduate of Chippensburg uh, University, and her name is Mary Birch, the same one I told you about, who stood up against all odds when the two bankers, there was three of them on a committee, and they wanted to locate Essex at in Verona. She stood up and said, that college belongs in Newark. So directly or indirectly, you should know that Mary B. Birch, there are people who have impact on your life, lives that you'll never know, but she had an impact on you. I don't know if you'd be able to come to Essex if it were up in Verona. Now we have quite a history and I've thought many times, I'm very proud to be an American. I've traveled all over the world, Europe, I've lived in Europe. Uh, 
traveled all over the world and I have a genuine appreciation for people and their genius. I had a chance to see the genius of places like Greece and Italy and Egypt and West Africa. But we were brought here against our will, sometimes sold by tribes uh, because there were tribal warfare uh, occasions and we were put on slave ships. And uh, many times only a third of the slaves that started out in Gori, and that's a place in Africa you should all visit. And I hope you will do it. All of us came through Gori and boarded the ships on the slave ship. And we uh, were not given a suite or a place to stretch out or a private uh, bathroom and what have you. We were packed in like sardines. And uh, we were would not get much air. And as you see there, the women down uh, in the bottom of the ship, the air was thick. And sometimes they would let them going. So the question is, if we could have gone back, gotten out of there, what would we have done? And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to be first students, but you have to finish. Turning back is not an option. There are people who are following you and your life who are depending on you, what you teach them. We have a very famous professor at Essex County College, a mother, uh, she's Professor Mamie Bridgeford. She came to Essex County College. Her husband was sick and she didn't have a job. And she had two babies on her arms and she uh, enrolled at Essex. She didn't have enough money for the entrance fee or the registration fee. And today she's the dean and the head of the social science department. But when she was growing up, students, her mother could not read. And they would take their homework to her mother. And mother would look at it and mother, no, not good enough. Go back, do it again. They bring it again. No, that's not good enough. Go back and do it again. And what I'm trying to tell you, students, is because her mother made and uh, put a discipline of learning on her. She is a polished speaker. She's an eloquent former uh, councilwoman in Newark, New Jersey. So there are people around us, right around Essex, that are famous. I wanted to talk about J. Harry Smith and some of the people, I'm talking about Mrs. Birch, but there are other heroes around Essex that were very important for our development. But the key point I want to make to you today is turning back is not an option. You are like a butterfly. We're born and you crawl. And you crawl on the ground as a caterpillar. And there were two caterpillars getting ready to cross a highway. And the caterpillar on the left was impatient. And he said, listen, man, I'm going across here. I don't care what you say. I want to go on the other side. So he took off crawling across there a little inch by inch. And here comes a big tractor trailer and squished him to the ground. And the other caterpillar said, this, there's got to be a better way to make it than this. <laughs> so he went back, he said, I'm going to go back to my cocoon and I, I'm going to get, I'm, I'm going to get me a change in this situation. So he went back into his cocoon and he began to change and be developed. And that's what you are, students. You are in a cocoon of learning. Here we are nurturing you. Here we are trying to give you a sense of thought, a sense of realism, a sense of value about yourself. Know your own value. So that when the next time that caterpillar came out of the cocoon, he wasn't crawling. He flew across that highway and he had what he needed in order to get across that highway. And so it is with you. Here we are at Essex, you're in a cocoon, so to speak, but we're trying to get you to learn as much as you can, to be excited about learning, to read, to look at the news, to find out where your news is coming from. Look at the science that has taken place. Look at last week, students, we put a, a, a machine on Mars and landed it. 
And so you say, well, what does that have to do with black history? Well, the point is, uh, who knows what, who worked in the space agency, but it is the brilliance of man. And then there's a woman who in North Carolina, if you recall, was very instrumental in the breakdown and the development of the vaccine. And Dr. Fauci gave her credit, black woman. Then there is the wonderful poet, 22 years of age who stood in front of the inauguration. And I wish I had time to play it here now, I might do it. But the point is there you saw a, a 22 year old woman standing with excellence, with speech diction, with imagination and the art of poetry. I tell you, it was some moment for me to see, and I really see her and I see you in her. So you're, you, you're not going back, but we had a hard time when we came and uh, we were on the farms, on the plantations, work every day. I think they work, uh, I think they work six days a week, sometimes seven, depending on the crop season. And these slaves uh, would raise cotton, they would raise tobacco, uh, they would raise these acres out in the field and be sold like they were pieces of property. But on the slave ship coming over, can you imagine that you, no toilet facilities, no shower facilities, no air, and yet you come across and you're coming across and you, one of those people there, and I hope you agree, is my ancestor. The reason I'm here today is because they endured coming across. And many times they would live in such crowded conditions. If you go down to the uh, National Museum of African American History, the Smithsonian and Essex has sponsored a trip. Again, Dean Slade, I appreciate you, those students that went down, but they had a cabin on the first floor where 16 people lived in one room. Now we're talking about yesterday, in Texas, there are people who are stuck, nine people were stuck in a room. We think that's terrible. And look at what the slaves went through. They were beaten. They were brought up uh, periodically for some air. <laughs> then they would take them back down. They, and we, this was our plate. And we would sit there uh, together. I guess if we had the co uh, coronavirus today, it'd be all over because there was no space Talking about stay six feet away, there's no way it was impossible in slavery time. And yet, the good Lord, irrespective of who you worship, got you here, and here we are today. And we developed uh, where we weren't as literate as we should have been because one of the greatest scenes in Roots, and everybody ought to see Roots, but the most powerful, uh, one of the most powerful scenes was when Kizzy, uh, the slave owner, his daughter had taught Kizzy how to read. And he came in, he thought he caught Kizzy reading and he went berserk and had her sent away. Why? Because when you can read, you can find out. And look at you students, you have the opportunity to find out. We live in a diverse society, every society. Our group is made up this is what we call a cultural pluralism. America is not a melting pot. It is a unique set of cultures. And we have Irish culture, we have African-American culture, we have Italian culture, we have Latino culture. So we see us as a diversity uh, in art, in ethnic traditions, in foods, uh, nothing like, uh, and at Essex we lost uh, a man who used to use st st Spanish stewed chicken. And every day he would fix that right there at Essex, the place would be packed out. Everyone wanted to identify with different recipes in this cultural pluralism we have. So we had uh, the Buffalo soldiers and I knew one, he, he was a doctor, he passed away not too long ago, but they escaped to the West. And then there's the Queen of Sheba who came 
Uh, and I wanted to kind of show you my hero, uh, who is uh, Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman proposed but now on hold as Andrew Jackson's replacement for the $20 bill. By the way, when Trump came in, he put a halt to that. And then when Why? Biden came in less than a month ago, has reversed that. So you will see her picture on the $20 bill very what shortly. What did you learn about her in school? That she ran away from slavery, then risked her own freedom to free others? One sentence, two, if that. I know it was tough and exhilarating. I'm sorry, I'm gonna leave you. A new film starring Cynthia Erivo, a made of a mother daughter, is meant to flesh out the Wikipedia entry when trouble comes. Are we ready? I saw her as a young woman who had a force of will that was almost unbreakable, and she was a superhero because of that. The more you discover about Harriet, Tubman, just big decision: you gonna you stay in slavery, or are you gonna get away? To pull off exploits, it would be an understatement to say we're daring. These are the only known representations in a photograph that we have. Kate Clifford Larson is Tubman's biographer. This is five feet tall. This is a representation of, of Tubman as a life-size person. On the eastern shore of Maryland, where she was born, the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Visitor Center opened in 2017. This tiny woman who could neither read nor write now has not one, but two national parks dedicated to her story. Would this have looked the way it did when Harriet Tubman was around? Yes, it would have looked exactly like this. She was born here, Araminta Woods, Lindsay for short, around 1822. Her parents were enslaved on different plantations and that far farm on the other side of the river, hours apart. Minty's life as a slave was horrific. It was uh, brutal. It was cruel. She and her mother were owned by Edward Brovis, who made $60 a year renting her out starting when she was six. She talked about how lonely and sad she was when she was separated from her mother and how she would cry herself to sleep at night. And then came the day when she was about 13 that she walked into the Bucktown Village store just as an overseer was trying to catch a runaway. When the overseer picked up one of these store weights, a two pound weight. That's you. Yes, and he threw it, intending to hit the young man who was fleeing. But Tubman had stepped back into the doorway and it slammed right into her skull. For the rest of her life, Harriet Tubman had sudden epileptic seizures and visions, she said, were from God. Harriet was her mother's name. Mindy began calling herself that when she married John Tubman. In 1849, as she escaped from this place, right here, right here, a place called Poplar Neck in Caroline County, Maryland, when word reached her that she was going to be sold south. Just look at a map. Imagine Harriet Tubman in her 20s, running away alone, on foot. So she would have come to this home. She managed, with the help of the Underground Railroad, to make it a hundred miles to the Pennsylvania border and freedom. But then Tubman went back thirteen times. Thirteen years, times, <laughs> leading more than seventy people to freedom. Now, this is a very crucial scene to me, students. This is where you get the essence. Sometimes it takes a leader to step off the banks and to go across so that those who follow would see that you could make it. And so when she stepped off of that bank, going across the river, she didn't know she could have hit a, a ravine area and gone right down. Could have been crocodiles, could have been all kinds of things happening there. But she had to step forward 
so that she was an example. And you may know people like that. They want to stay back on shore, see? They're going to see if you're going to make it or not, see? And so here you are, students. You're a leader. You may not see and think you are, but you are. You're a leader. People are watching you and their destiny. It really happened. So when they saw that she was going to make it, during the Civil they War, said we can she make it. the first American woman ever to lead troops into battle near Beaufort, South Carolina. They blew up the bridge. They liberated 750 enslaved people off the plantations along that river. And the newspapers at the time wrote about this, this raid, and they credited the raid to the Black she Moses. Harriet Tubman had an amazing Forrest Gump-like ability to be at the center of history. Her friends among its key figures, abolitionists Frederick Douglass and John Brown. Now, by the way, Frederick Douglass, I wish my friend uh, Professor Linwood Gun Gunther was still around. He could, he could speak about him. He was a faculty member at Essex. See, Essex has its own history. Clem Price, the famous historian, from Rutgers University started at Essex. But Frederick Douglass, and uh, during uh, Trump's first period, I always, it's really not funny, but anyway, uh, it was 2017, February 2017. So they wanted to show that Trump could show a little bit of appreciation for black history. So they came out and they said, and Frederick Douglass did so and so, and Frederick Douglass and, and, and Trump said, He's doing a wonderful job. Yes, we're very happy. I, I, I heard about and I want to meet him. This is Mr. President. He's been dead for a hundred years. See, ignorant man. Now the man on the right there, John Brown, I showed you, uh, my art student, how he was hanged. Remember that painting I showed you by Artist Pippin, the black artist who painted John Brown's hanging. And it yes, showed him. You remember, remember that? that. Yes. And so, and so that was the John Brown. Yes. He died before the Civil War started. But what I'm saying is we have such a rich... Tubman was a passionate campaigner for women's suffrage alongside Susan B. Anthony. She spent the last 50 years of her remarkable life here in Auburn, New York, where William Henry Seward, President Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of State, and his wife, Frances, offered their friendship and support. She was a regular guest, a social visitor, welcomed here. So right in the old house kitchen, you're- Jeff Ludwig is education director at the Seward House Museum in Auburn. It was known that Harriet Tubman was looking to place her family somewhere and to plant roots somewhere, to build a home for herself. And so they offer her a piece of land. Seven acres, a black woman, technically a fugitive slave, buying a farm, unheard of. In 1869, she got married again to Nelson Davis, more than 20 years her junior. This is an amazing house. It was one of nine cottages. In her 70s, she opened an old age home for formerly in- That's somebody doing something for our people. Memory, providing free health care to any black or white. She was a lightning rod for change. Karen Vivian Hill heads the Harriet Tubman home. She was the Serena Williams of her time. Okay. Bold, bad, black, beautiful. We know she was deeply religious and that she had secret pleasures. Strawberries were her favorite dessert. So we found strawberry seeds all over the property and in white china, which is so unlike Harriet for her to have this affection uh, for these very fine things. So who was Harriet Tubman really? This is just the Tubman scrapbook, as my mother called it, to Judith Bryant. She was aunt Harriet. And a great, great grand niece. Descended from Harriet's brother, William Henry Stewart. He and two other brothers she rescued from Maryland in 1854. She's got bragging rights, but chooses not to brag. It's my family. People always say, oh, I didn't know you were related to Harry Tubman. Of course you didn't, but I did. <laughs> we did. She invokes her famous relative. 
is when things go right. We have this expression, I, I do, it's Harriet's work in overtime. She's sort of my guardian angel. Tough and resolute to the very end. This was Harriet Tubman the year before she died in Auburn on March 10th, 1913. She was 91 or thereabouts. Her funeral was a major event. I traveled all over the world. One of my great um, adventures is uh, Ethiopia. And um, my grandfather was decorated by the emperor of Ethiopia. I want to show you that picture. I want to show you a little bit of uh, Makeba, who was the queen of Sheba. And she admired Solomon and had heard about his wisdom. See, when you're smart, people find out about it. And uh, there are many people in our lives, students, they didn't get a chance to go to college like us, but they are brilliant and they are geniuses. My father-in-law, he, he didn't get out of eighth grade, but he could put take a whole engine down and put it back up again. Uh, I know another preacher who built a, a college campus and seven churches, you know, and never got out of 10th grade. So there are people who perform, people who have, and my coach used to say it when I was in high school, he said, you have to be successful. You have to have a brain, a heart, and somewhere back here, you gotta have a more, a, a motor. You can be smart, but if you don't turn on that motor, you're not going to succeed. Or you may not have too much up here, but if you have a heart and you turn on that motor, I know many people have become very successful in their uh, endeavors. So the Queen of Sheba, uh, and there have been many uh, works of art uh, artists, but if you live below the equator line there, or if you were in the Sudan, below that white line, generally you're gonna, your skin is going to be uh, brown. Why? Because, not because uh, of some racial identity. And someone told me when I was in elementary school, the reason, and the someone asked, said, why are we brown and black? And the teacher said, God put us in the oven, left us in the oven a little longer <laughs> than, um, than the other people, which you know is ridiculous, but the, there are people who would put something like that out. Uh, but we are brown because of the ultraviolet rays of the sun would destroy our skin. When I go to Egypt, students, I have to stand out, but I can't stand outside long. Can't be out long. Now, this is in the Middle East. This is in Israel. Uh, the people who are the descendants of the Canaanites and Cush. Cush uh, is uh, the Ethiopia. He, he established Ethiopia. See, so when we go through and we see where most people, they said the first man. Then the great artist Gauguin, he got stuck on the Isle of uh, Tahiti. And uh, he started painting these beautiful brown and black women. And his most famous paintings are those. So that skin is darker to absorb the ultraviolet rays of the sun. This hair is kinky here. That's a protection that I have. My geological reality of my relatives, it protected them against the ultraviolet rays of the sun. And these two children here could not live in the Sudan. These women can because of their skin being too. So physical appearance changes in a geological sense. And when you look, and even if you're not a biblical scholar, you know that uh, Ham and the Cushites and Egyptians and the Libyans and the Canaanites, uh, they all came from a man. I took this picture here, and this was in Jericho. And that's a man who was a Canaanite. When you're at the Wailing Wall in Israel, you see a lot of Ethiopian people there worship. So when you look at the map, you look at Europe, but you look at 
where we call Ham's country, all the orange here. And it even covered the area we know today as Israel. But that was Ham's country, uh, promoted by uh, the uh, Ethiopians. I want you just to look at this. When, when Sheba traveled for months in order to meet Solomon. This is world history. Then I want to show you its relationship. When I, I, I go to Israel, sometimes I'll go up in the uh, mountains near Lebanon and I go to the kibbutz. They have three adults on every child. In other words, their schooling system is so emphatic. Now, if you notice on the news, the Israelis, they have about 90% of their people have been vaccinated. See, and we are slow moving along. We're only about 10%. We're not moving fast at all. So what I want you to see, uh, great ones, and I call my students great ones, I want you to see the richness of uh, places in which we have learned from people from which we have learned. And I want you to see it. I'm, I'm not just trying to, I'm not being a show off here when I show you in front of the pyramid, but that pyramid there is 4,500 uh, years old. It was created in 2,500 BC. It's a perfect isosceles triangle. And I might look like I'm all three, you know, but I jumped off the bus, and, but it was 140 degrees. I had to come right back and get right back on it. But when I uh, go to Egypt and can appreciate what they did for the world, they were an ingenious people. It took 200,000 men 20 years to build that one pyramid. Block by block, they were uh, very ingenious in the way they took. And the key to building that pyramid was not that it was blocks, it was organization. Each block had to be fit into a plan. And so it is. And the way they moved them, they put logs underneath, and then they put water in front of the logs, wet the logs, and then they pulled the wet ones out and put it in the front. But it was a slippery process. But when you look at the art, you look at this piece of sculpture here, Ramesses, there's no, no doubt in your mind that that is... And Ramesses the Great was one of the greatest builders in uh, Ethiopia, uh, excuse me, in Egypt. So when I see this, I'm very proud of the fact that my grandfather was decorated by the emperor of Ethiopia. And um, he was a descendant of, are you with me? And when she went to see him, she left him. She was pregnant when she left uh, Israel. And she had a child uh, by him. His name was Melanick the first. He was a son of Solomon. And all of those, uh, see, we call it the line of Judah, but Solomon was in the line of Judah. So through the Queen of Sheba, King Millenlik was born, and he perpetuated uh, the Jewish faith in Israel. And the man you see over here on the left, I've always been so proud, is my grandfather. Here's the emperor. And he said he was from the tribe, uh, he's from the line of Judah. That's very important, direct lineage. He claimed lineage to Solomon through that king, uh, Bilalik. He That's where he got his heritage from. And so when he came to New York, this is in the 50s, and, and he gave Adam Powell and my grandfather over there, and this is Mayor Wagner of New York at the time, and presented them with the Star of Ethiopia and uh, he had promised my grandfather some land in Ethiopia. He with, visited him in the palace and they became very good friends. And I was always very proud of his relationship 
with the queen of Sheba. So all these people, uh, the woman they talked about, the woman at the well, she was a Samaritan woman. She was a woman of color. And the way the world has become, it's a world. And here is the back throne of King Tutankhamun with his wife. Her name was Akka Cinnamon. And he was, he, he was, became Pharaoh when he was nine. He died when he was 19. But the point is uh, that she was the daughter of Nefertiti. And then of course, there's the whole foundation with Moses. Moses was raised in the palace of Egypt. And so there are many things we can talk about when it comes to people. So this 2021 students, we didn't get here by ourselves. There were many people who came and they suffered and even died so that we could be where we are today. Lyndon Johnson, and I don't mean to make this all because many people have helped uh, people of color, particularly in this country. One major one was Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the wife of President Roosevelt. She, they didn't think blacks could fly planes. She went down to Tuskegee, Alabama, and she said, I, I think they can. And she got in one of the planes and they took off for a flight. Well, that, that blew that argument away. When Marion Anderson couldn't perform uh, at the uh, Daughters of the Revolution, it was Eleanor Roosevelt that made a space for her to sing. And then uh, there's so many things where she interceded for black people that we just don't want to make our heroes all black. We want to make sure uh, Lyndon Johnson, who grew up as a Southerner, but his wife had black people to raise her. She had an abiding respect and appreciation for black people. And she worked on Lyndon Johnson. So when he became president, he wanted to do something. And when you look at what Kennedy did, it's only Lincoln stands out before him. But when you look at the other presidents, it was Lyndon Johnson who signed the voting rights bill they're trying to get that back now because they removed some of those things. And there's a movement right now to make it so that people of color in this country uh, don't vote. They're trying to do is called voter suppression. So we need to be concerned. But he made the ultimate sacrifice uh, so that we could be. So that old person that's in your house, your grandmother, they prayed for you. They sacrificed for you. And they're some of the real heroes. Talk about black history. Those are the heroes. Some of our greatest heroes were right in the house where we grew up and have become professionals. And it was Arthur Ashe who said, he was a great tennis player who passed away. The best way to judge a life is to ask yourself, did I make the best use of time I had? That's powerful. You didn't go on the beach. You don't have a, a yacht. But did you do something for somebody? So at this time, I'd like to close out and uh, say I want to thank Joe uh, for all of his efforts. I want to thank my students who came. I want to thank Professor or Dean Slade and uh, Dean Graham. I want to thank everyone in the Student Activities Department for the opportunity of presenting a Black History Program. Joe? We would like to thank, on behalf of Student Life and Activities, the legendary Dr. Robert Spellman for joining us today. Students, please give Dr. Spellman a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Sir, we thank you again for another amazing, informative, and classic Black History Celebration. We thank you for bringing it to our students on Zoom, even though we can't do this in person. Students, trust me, this is one of the events that we cannot wait to get back to do in person with you when it is safe to do so, which is looking like it's hopefully soon, maybe later this year. Keep your fingers crossed, stay warm, stay positive, and we will catch you next time. Take care. <laughs>